Hi, everyone. So uh, the first speaker of this um, first session of the second day is Diane Brenton from Macy University in New Zealand. And she will present. So this is a pre-recorded video, but the talk is entitled a Conservation Translocation Aimed at Maximizing Song Diversity, the Song Diversity and Song Neighborhoods of Tiyeki, North Island Saddleback, two years on. Everybody, my name is Diane Brunton and I'm a behavioral ecologist based at Massey University in Auckland, New Zealand. Now it's wonderful to have the opportunity that this conference gives us to communicate our science to people all around the world. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to, to talk to you today about some of the research that we have been doing on this wonderful species that is behind me, Tiaki, the North Island Saddleback. We've been studying song of this species for a number of years. And the, the results that I'm going to talk to you about today are the most uh, the latest research that we have been doing on this bird. So New Zealand's well known for its conservation efforts. And Tiaki was uh, the first official species to, to really be the focus of, of translocation. And it's been highly successful. But Tiaki are also fascinating in terms of the rapid development of their song cultures. So the work that I'm going to be talking to you about is the intersection between conservation and behavioral ecology. Now, conservation for the last few years has used information that it's gathered from behavioral work to figure out the best way to translocate and support the survival of a species such as tiaki. But it can work the other way too. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is where translocations, a conservation translocation, has actually, is actually helping us understand the song culture of the species. First of all, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the background of conservation for tiaki, because it's important, and a little bit about the song research we've done over the last 10 years or so. And then the focus is really going to be on how we designed an experiment, an experimental translocation that aimed to maximize genetic diversity, which is important in terms of conservation, but also cultural diversity of the species. Asking the questions, particularly around culture, does it matter? And what can we learn when we do these kind of translocations with a specific aim around culture in mind? Now, Tiaki, North Island Saddleback, uh, it's a New Zealand wattle bird. It was widespread throughout New Zealand uh, at the time of European settlement, but it's a poor flyer as are many New Zealand birds. Forest dweller, lives a long time, up to 20 years, territorial year round, Males sing this, this wonderful rhythmic song. It actually is a little bit like a car engine starting. It just repeats a certain phrase over and over, and it's called an MRS. Now, they tend to nest in cavities and roost in cavities, and they will do this on the ground often as well. And so this is why they're, they're very vulnerable to introduce predators. From early work by Peter Jenkins, we know that the, the males, the sons disperse and tend to learn the song from the neighborhood they disperse to when they set up a new territory. So this is, this is Hen Island, uh, 1903, Tiaki were restricted to Hen Island. In 1964, the first translocation was done from Hen to nearby Fodapuki. So Hen Island here you can see is located in the far north. Uh, on the northeast coast. And Fodapuki is, this is the island just off the coast here from Hen. Now, this is from the beginning of 2020. We have translocated Saddleback to a large number of locations. Mostly, these are offshore islands that have been protected uh, by removal of predators and pests and have ongoing management. But increasingly, as these islands become, become fewer, there's fewer of them that don't have Saddleback already, we've started to use locations on the mainland that have predator control, either through a predator-proof fence or through ongoing intensive predator control. Of all of the, these, are all of the translocations that have been done up until, this is accurate till about 18 months ago, the, the ones in black have been successful. The grey have not been. So most of the translocations of Tiaki have been successful. So these uh, translocations have offered us an opportunity, in fact, to understand song culture. So our initial project uh, more than 10 years ago with Kevin Parker, who was a PhD student working with me at the time, 
we use the, the existing translocations to test some theory about, uh, about song culture. Natural system, the birds were of, of translocations, the advantages that the birds are of known age, sex and origin. And for Saddleback, once you put them in a location, they're not going to leave. They can't fly off these islands and only males sing. And what we found was rapid rates of change. So independent of genetic processes, we found these really rapid changes within each of these islands and the islands diversified over a period of time. So it gave us some insights into the effect that isolation has on song in this species. Now this gives you an idea of what it looked like then. Um, basically you've got Hen Island, the original population, the sole for that species. And then you've got these series of translocations that were done. It, first level translocation, second level, third level. So a series of subsampling. And um, this of course is a nice experimental setup that wasn't designed to, to test how song evolves. Now, just to give you some idea about what the song sounds like. Here is a hen. And here is Motopora, a level two translocation. So you can hear the repeated nature, but you can also see here that th those are very, very different. With that first project, when we ran our analyses, uh, non-metric multi-dimensional scaling, uh, what we found was that there was rapid evolution. We've got essentially two lineages that we could identify uh, that came out of hen. So these colors, the red, blue, and the yellow, represent those, those initial, those three initial translocations from hen island. And you can see that these uh, island populations have really diverged. So this is only over a period of, of 30 to 40 years. So rapid evolution. So what we can ask now is, do these differences matter? We've got considerable variation in the MRSs across these, this metapopulation. But do they matter in terms of the behavioral ecology of the, of the tiaki? So how do you test that? Well, one way to test it is to do translocations as an experiment. So there, we did two of these where we mix the populations, the source populations, to set up a new population. So you've got a mix of song cultures, mix of, of genetic diversity, of course. And the two that we did, Tafranui, in the blue one here, had three sources, and Shakespeare had two sources. One of them was Tafranui, and the other was Territory Martini. So these give us an opportunity to actually test what effect uh, the mixed sources would have. Now, the student that worked on this, Kyle Sutherland, is a master's student. He came from Canada, and initially he was going to work on Tafranui. Now, what happened was not only did COVID hit, but also predators hit. And so this is where conservation really had an impact on the design of our experiment. So there was an incursion at Tafanui Regional Park. And so what happened at the end, we had to adapt to this research. So Kyle went on to compare three sites and, and Tafanui, which had three uh, sources, eight years post translocation, Shakespeare with two, two years post, so very recent, Motoihi, which was a single source. Today, I'm going to focus on the Shakespeare results. So we asked, Four questions. Has song diversity increased, decreased, or remained the same? Do we retain all of those original MRSs from the source populations, um, or have we lost some? And could it have increased in terms of novel songs arising? Because we know that the things rapidly change. Does a sort of pairing occur based on the source of location? So do we have birds that came from Terry uh, pairing up together and birds that came from Taft pairing up together? And how does MRS sharing relate to the distance between territories? So do you have uh, cultural neighborhoods, which you see in established populations of, of Saddleback? And what song dialects are learned and sung by first generation males? So we set about answering these questions, very simple methodology, uh, field recordings of the 25 males that had set up territories, not all of the males, not all of the birds survived the translocations. All of the translocated males were, had unique color bands on them, which was very nice. And all of the first generation males, because this is, this is in the second year following translocation, were unbanded. So any saddleback we saw without a band on, we know it was a first generation male. 
the re we built up a recording database, um, making sure we had at least five replicates from each bird, good, good song recordings. And we analyzed these using COE, which is a, an open source software that we have developed. And we narrowed it down to 48 spectral features um, that are out of the 200 or so that COE does uh, that, that actually gave us good resolution of the data. We used a non-metric multi-dimensional scaling ordination to cluster. So you can see a spectrogram examples here on the right hand side. So we, we analyze the repeated section of uh, the Saddleback song. So when we do this, we came up with out of 321 recordings, we found 20 MRS types. So here they are pictured in the ordination space. And uh, so there, there's reasonable distinction between uh, many of the, the groups. Some are only represented by a few examples, but, they, but our analysis showed that they were distinct. Now, the interesting part about this, I think, is that we had five novel MRSs, five MRSs that weren't found in, that weren't part of either of the source populations that were new to the site in this year. Now, when we can look at some of the other aspects of the repertoires of the birds at the site and compare it to the other sites, look at mean repertoire size, for example, the, the two source populations and then Shakespeare, you can see that the repertoire size of, of just over two per bird uh, uh, MRSs is, is pretty much the same as the other two populations. So if we take a look at the mean repertoire size with age, you can see that the founders who are at least two years of age and the first generation birds have similar size repertoires. Now, if you take a look at the repertoire composition, the founder males um, continue to, to sing this, the MRSs that they, that they sung, that, that are found at their source population. So that's not surprising. But the first generation males, the MRSs that they sang, they all, all of them sang a combination of either a, an, an ancestral MRS or a novel one, but they only had a, an MRS that was from one source, but no first generation birds sung MRSs that came from the two source populations. Now, assortative mating, so we do have some degree of assortative mating, but we also have lots of mixed pairs. So if we take a look at the territories of all of the birds at Shakespeare, and color them based on whether they are, the birds came from Tafranui, Tiri, first generation. Um, we do have a few unknown here in green. This is because this area here is within a naval base where they test ammunitions. So our getting access to this depended on when they weren't testing ammunitions. And unfortunately, we couldn't get in and identify the birds on these territories. But regardless, what we see is that you've got um, the first generation birds are scattered throughout the park. Uh, it's reasonably well known for Saddleback that in fact they, they form these cultural neighborhoods, if you like. So MRS is dialect neighborhoods, even in a relatively small area of a single valley where particular MRSs are only found. So we look for evidence of this and, and what we can see again, we've done an ordination. And uh, if you compare, if you take a look at where those are, these represent the, the, the male identification. If we take a look at where they are, what we do is we do see evidence of kind of cultural neighborhoods, but this is really based on the settlement patterns uh, that we found post-translocation. So our conclusions, song diversity increased at Shakespeare. We had not only uh, managed to retain all those, so the, the MRSs from the source populations, from both source populations, but we have new uh, MRSs arising. A sort of pairing did occur to some extent, but it wasn't exclusive. And we don't think that the MRSs alone can act as a, as a pre-mating barrier. We did see evidence for distinct cultural neighborhoods, but the spatial patterns of those MRSs just seem to be determined more by the settlement of those founders. Now, first generation males did inherit ancestral song, but there wasn't a single tiaki that we recorded that sung both source types. And then rapid innovation of, of male rhythmic songs is probably one of the most exciting things to see where we've, we've noted this in the, in the very first generation of males, a, a considerable number of new MRSs. Now, if the conservation translocation goal for Shakespeare was to increase both cultural and genetic diversity, then it was a success.
But there's a sad note to this. Unfortunately, as happened with Tafranui, a predators have uh, got into the park and um, the, the saddleback population has been significantly uh, impacted. So many of these new, in fact, not, if not all of these brand new MRSs are now gone because the birds that sung them are gone. Finally, I'd like to thank a, a big group of people actually. So many of the people that have been out helping us record, uh, my family who I drag to um, uncomfortable places. Thank you very much. Questions? So that was a very nice talk, Diane. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we are waiting for questions in the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. There are none at the moment, but I have some questions to, to ask. Good. So I don't know anything about birds because I'm specialized in social insects. But I was wondering, uh, is this song diversity, can, can, can it lead to speciation in some way if it's related to sexual courtship, for instance? Um, Yes, I mean, I, I'm sure it, it can. There are some species where that's been found. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we thought would, might happen with the, the saddleback. Um, you know, some of these island populations, because the birds can't fly off the islands and, and they stay there and the song changes so rapidly, um, we, you know, potentially the females might just ignore males from another island when you do put them together. And um, we did do playback in a different set of experiments. We did playbacks on some of these islands of uh, other island song. And we did get a very uh, reduced response to unfamiliar song. So that was part of the motivation for doing the experiments that we did do by putting them all together. And fortunately, the birds are not as fussy as one would uh, think based on just on song. Yeah. That's fascinating. And like your field work mo must be amazing as well. No? <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of organization to, to get there, though, Yeah, for a small period of time. Yeah. So we have now questions in the YouTube chat. The first one is from Bhavya Pratap Singh. He says, what do you think is the reason for this rapid evolution of novel MRS in F1 generation? Um, we've thought about this a lot. I mean, I, th I think with the saddleback uh, that they can reach very high densities on some of these in some of these locations when you don't have these introduced predators, and and there is a lot. They're not a not a particularly aggressive bird, but they are constantly using song to communicate with each other, with neighbours, and and then they they do have these kind of little gatherings on the boundary of territories where they interact. So I think there's that rapid, that diversity means it might, might give them an opportunity to understand who their neighbors are. Um, you know, I, I don't have a good answer for that, I'm afraid, but uh, they, they clearly are very good at, um, the young males are very good at copying, uh, but not perfect. And so you get these errors slipping in. Yeah. So All right. Then a great answer. <laughs> we have a lot more questions. Um, okay. So Abby George is asking you questions, but it's part of the ABL committee. So maybe I'm going to skip this one and go <laughs> for Mariela Herberstein, who said, "Very nice talk. What is the conservation plan for this population now?" Um. Yes. The the trying to get the predators under control. And I have a, a new project based on Saddleback as well. So I'm really keen that the, we get the predators under control, that the numbers have come down to a low level. I think once we get the predators sorted, um, particularly it, there are some stoats that have got in. Um, once those are sorted, then I, you know, then the, the population will increase. And, and perhaps what we'll think about doing, but this will depend on DOC, on Department of Conservation, um, reintroducing more birds. So, yeah, it's, but of course the predators have got to be controlled first. All right. 
Um, so you have several comments that are saying that it was a great talk, and so thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. April Timis is asking, just wondering what predators are now on the island? Um, it's stoats, stoats and ship rats are uh, the, the big ones that have got in. Occasionally cats. So the islands are fine. The islands don't have it. Tafranui and Shakespeare are both peninsulas with a predator-proof fence. So they're kind of a mainland island, if you like. They're surrounded by sea. But there are, the incursions have come around the fence on the beaches, on the edges. Yeah. So um, stoats, cats, rats, the usual thing for New Zealand. All right. Thank you very much. I think our time is 